live from the new Community Civic Center in downtown Muncie, Indiana, this is Muncie at the Millennium, a town meeting, a unique opportunity for community dialogue. Now, here's your moderator, Steve Bell. Good evening and welcome to our second live town meeting. Again tonight, our focus is on Muncie at the Millennium, our challenges and our opportunities. We'll be talking about public education and about racial, political divisions in the search for a community consensus. For each topic area, a panel of experts and community leaders will take questions and comments from our live audience and from telephone calls. Our first topic tonight, education. In a world where education and training are keys to the future, how do Muncie area public schools stack up? How do we measure performance and accountability? And how do we guarantee workforce education and training? Our second hour topic will be images and attitudes. What about Muncie's reputation for government turmoil and a divided community? How do we plan effectively for the future? And how do we find a community consensus? Our town meetings are being produced by WIPB-TV and the Ball State University Department of Telecommunications. They're being simulcast tonight on WLBC and WBST Radio. Now let's begin our focus on public education. Before meeting our panelists, let's take a look at where we stand today as the Greater Muncie Area considers its challenges and opportunities. Janet Babin of WBST Radio has this report. Recommended action. Return to five-year full accreditation status. After a year on state probation, Muncie Central High School is fully accredited again. Central had been cited for poor leadership and staff members who refused to accept responsibility for student achievement. But new principal Dick Daniel and a faculty-led committee produced a turnaround. The school had really uh, kind of fallen apart in a lot of areas, and so it was really from kind of zero that you start to rebuild. Students are very concerned with this process and they have, of course, a lot more than anyone. They're the, the biggest stakeholders. For Central, a wake-up call, but if state and national tests are any measure, public education in the Muncie area has a big challenge. In the latest I-STEP Plus test, the state's measure of accomplishment, only Burris and Cowan 10th graders scored in the top 15 percent among state high schools and a majority of Muncie 10th graders failed the exam. At the sixth grade level, Burris, Daleville, Yorktown, and Cowan were among the top 15% statewide, but countywide, less than 50% of sixth graders passed I-STEP+. Reaction to the test scores varies. Muncie Superintendent Marlon Creasy. Our I-STEP scores have, have improved over the past two years, uh, and we're pleased to see that. But we're also not pleased that our overall I-STEP scores are not what we think they should be in our school corporation. Dr. Thomas Schroeder, Associate Dean of Ball State's Teachers College. I-STEP uh, becomes the one measure by which we measure everything, and, and, and we know that that's not appropriate. It's, it's a sample of student performance. State Representative Bruce Munson. I-STEP itself is under fire right now as being a flawed measurement. Whether it's flawed or not, some local schools have real problems even stacking up against other schools in Indiana. It is now the time for the changing of the tassels. Despite some protests, students now must pass I-STEP to graduate, and in Muncie, it now takes a diploma to participate in graduation ceremonies. Allison Madsen teaches at Central High. I think maybe that will motivate some students to buckle down if they know they're not going to walk across that stage at graduation time. Also at issue is teacher accountability. Should teachers be accountable for student achievement? Is merit pay the answer? Do unions block accountability? Again, there is debate. Pat Kennedy of the Muncie Teachers Union. We need to be supporting each other. If you put in a financial incentive based on a test or a set of test scores, then I think that it sets up an automatic mistrust and people uh, not being as willing, teachers not being as willing to support each other. Justin Heat studies education for the Hudson Institute. It's not so much the threat of underperformance that drives excellence, it's the reward for better performance that drives excellence. And the fact is good teachers uh, would clearly be rewarded under a system that allows for it to happen. 
Joy Pinniger is a concerned parent. One thing could improve in our school system would be parents would have a stronger voice than they do. Whatever the answer, the business community has a big problem with many high school graduates. David Holtz from the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Frankly, the biggest problem for graduates or, or for the employers is that the kids that come into our workforce um, don't have the necessary skills in math um, or English language arts to succeed in the workforce today. For the Muncie area, Ivy Tech is designed to bridge any gaps between high school and the workforce and much more. Rob Jeffs is chancellor. Our primary role in the community is to uh, is to help folks get into jobs, help train the incumbent worker that is underemployed, and try to develop a, a technical workforce that will allow the chamber and economic development folks to help bring in new businesses. They do a good job by making it a step above high school, but not throwing you into a big mix. It's really helped me not only to develop my skills, but also to be more open. But the presence of Ball State University may be the key to attracting the kinds of new jobs that will help the Muncie area transition to the new high-tech economy. Warren Vanderhill is provost. One of the things we've tried to do recently is to be more helpful in terms of the economic development of the community. The university uh, began to play a significant role in trying to engage in the training of the workforce. A major university can provide faculty and student resources that are attractive to many businesses. Will Davis heads Ontario Corporation, a high-tech computer company in Muncie. One of the real key things that we have to do is to tap into the tremendous resource that is the university. Education for the new millennium. For the Muncie area, the resources appear to be in place, but many tough questions are being asked. And now let's meet the panelists who will help us discuss education tonight. First of all, Carol D'Amico, adjunct fellow at the Hudson Institute, a frequent critic of Indiana's public schools. Roy Weaver, dean of Ball State Teachers College, which provides education and training for many of our area's teachers. Karen Cruz, a concerned parent with a child in the Muncie school system. Marlon Creasy, superintendent, Muncie Community Schools, and formerly he held the same position for the Delaware Community Schools. And Greg Holzer, biology teacher, president of the Yorktown Professional Educators Association, which just reached agreement with the school system on a new contract. Uh, Carol D'Amico, you're the outsider looking in. You, are, you have a bit of a reputation as a critic of much of the public school system. How do you perceive Muncie when you look at this community within this state? Well, Steve, as you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in Muncie, but I have looked at the uh, data. Uh, I have studied education in Indiana now for many years, and we do have a crisis in education in Indiana, and uh, Muncie has several challenges that were highlighted very well in that video. Uh, we have a high percentage of our students who will not be prepared for either work or post-secondary education when they leave school in May. And those are the ones that have stayed. Uh, we have a very high dropout in this rate in this state. We don't know really how many have left uh, because they couldn't pass the gra graduation test. Uh, so we, our, our challenges are, are severe. And the recent Hudson Institute study that was released showed that even our top students in this state do not compare very well at all to the top students uh, in other states. And it, do we have a response here from uh, Superintendent Creasy? Well, I, I agree that our schools need to continue to improve. I think that, <clears throat> I don't know if I agree that we're at a crisis. I think what we've seen in Indiana, uh, particularly over the last three to five years, is an awareness that we absolutely have to improve without excuses. Uh, I'm probably one of the few who didn't take exception to the Hudson report recently um, because I think rather than being overly critical, it, it highlighted at every level we have to improve. We agree with that. I think Indiana, the Indiana General Assembly with Public Law 1750 has taken a, a good step in uh, demanding accountability within the schools. They're putting the responsibility uh, within the school itself. Uh, they've given a great deal of freedom uh, to the individual building administrator. Uh, I suspect, though, there's going to be a lot of battles to see whether that's going to go into place. But I agree. 
We know we need to improve, but I would suggest to you we are improving. And I want to pick up on that in just a second, but first we want to remind those of you who are listening or viewing television and radio that we have telephone numbers for you to call, 747-4949 for your questions. Uh, and you just call in any time and our, your questions will be taken and uh, we'll have an opportunity to answer some of them, if not all of them. Um, Karen Cruz, from a parent's perspective, what's your reaction to this dual prognosis, if you will? Well, I am a very concerned parent. Um, I read, um, and from what I understand, and what, from what I have seen, um, our schools are in trouble. As a parent, I don't know a lot of what's going on with the professionals. Um, but I feel that we are, I've, I've read the Hudson report. Uh, I know the figures. Um, I know the dropout rate. I know kids graduating are not um, among the high, the, the percent, their percentage is compared to the country is not as high as some others in the country. So I'm very concerned. Roy Weaver, the, the education educator, uh, how do we use these statistics? There are these constant surveys that provide some kind of a assessment and, and we hear some people say, hey, it's important and other people say it's not. I think uh, this community is in a unique position and is coming together in ways that uh, are historical for, for communities. And it may sound Pollyannish to say that in some respects, but uh, we recognize over the past decade the critical importance of the early years in child development and intellectual attainment. And uh, the governor's recent announcement that a institute for child development would be located at the university really builds on a four-year community effort with teamwork for quality living, uh, key performance area of education. We gathered together four years ago to say, rather than asking the schools to do one more thing, uh, what is it that would be most important for this community to try to do collectively to make a difference for the long term? So we think the focus on child, uh, quality child care, uh, parental support, linkages with the birthing center at the Ball Memorial Hospital are one critical initiative. Another recent one is a community compact that's a, a broad coalition headed by Steven Anderson and led by others, which is an effort to say that this community is going to unite. And when I say this community, I'm saying Delaware County. We are all going to unite around the philosophical position that every child is our child. But and I think those are two key differences uh, in this community, unlike some others. And I could continue if you'd well, like. <laughs> well, I want to pick those themes up. But uh, first, I'd like to just, uh, I'll open it up to anybody. Uh, there is a controversy over whether or not you can look at ISTEP, whether or not you can look at uh, uh, SATs, uh, other figures, whether that is a measure of what our students are and are not doing. And it is one uh, measure. And it's, it's given on a day when each child is in a particular, each child that's there to take the test comes to school in a particular way. Uh, there is the anxiety of the test. Uh, there's a great difference in, in how children come to school every day. Some of our children come from high-income families where children have three meals a day, two parents at home, the luxury of access to books, internet, television, all kinds of resources. There are other children who are afraid to go home some days. Or there may be someone there two or three hours after they get home. The only meal they may get is the meal they get at school. And so it seems to me that we need to look at this very, very carefully and not generalize to say that all students in schools come to school prepared to learn the same way, nor should we expect them to achieve at the same level. There's much work to be done, but it's much broader than laying blame to schools, teacher education. There's a community, collective, responsibility and moral obligation to make a difference. Steve, I want to Great say something about those yeah. measures. Um, I would agree that you can't take I-STEP and use it as a measure of, of performance in it, of itself. But the report that was produced by Hudson took uh, many measures 
Uh, ISEP was one. SAT, being 45th in the country on SAT scores, Indiana is. And when you look at similar states where a high percentage of students take the test, we're 19 out of 22. Uh, we're 49th in the country on the scores of advanced placement tests. Uh, we were 50th last year. We moved up one slot. Uh, we beat out Mississippi. Thank God for Mississippi. Um, so we're 49th in the country on advanced placement. When you look at the income levels of the students who take the SAT, uh, our high income level students from high income families, the best educate, from the best educated families, uh, perform about dead last compared to their peers across the country. So you have to look at the, all of these measures. Well, I, I, might, yeah. I might react to that because, Carol, I'm going to disagree a bit. And, and there will be, uh, just as I didn't take offense to, to, to the report that was given out, there will be a, a report that's going to be given out on our students who we feel are prepared, who take the SAT, and that's students who prepare the, uh, the core 40 in Indiana. Those students compare uh, favorably and, and very highly, I think you'll see in the report, with similar type students taking the same type of academic uh, preparation across the United States. So I agree our SAT scores are, are, are very poor in Indiana when you're looking at SAT scores. When you're comparing students of comparable uh, academic preparation, where I think Indiana has not forced students to take the type of test, our students compare favorably. Well, if that's true for Muncie, and I, I believe you, no, you would, speaking, you would be, I, No, I'm speaking out for the state you, of Indiana. Oh, well, I'd say you'd be unique in the state because uh, what the Hudson showed was of students who took honors courses in Indiana and compared it with honors courses in other states, we did not fare very well. Greg oh. Holzer, uh, we haven't gotten you in here yet. You're the teacher. <laughs> You're the teacher in the classroom who's uh, administering the tests, who's preparing for them. Uh, you come from Yorktown, where you right. certainly have plenty of upscale uh, young people uh, in your, and I mean that financially, the mm -hmm. families are, are well off. Uh, what's your perception of the role of testing in all this and, and its value as a measure? Well, I, I agree with Dr. Weaver. It is a measure. Uh, it is not, certainly not the only measure that, that we can use. Uh, and I also agree that we have a lot of students who come to us with problems that go far beyond what we can manage within our classroom, and we work within that. I know uh, a lot of businesses criticized education uh, that we don't uh, produce as well as someone in business might under the similar circumstances, but I would propose uh, that in business oftentimes they can, they can choose the own raw materials that they purchase. Uh, we don't control which students come to us. We don't control the family background that they come from. And so I think uh, in some ways the comparisons that were made with, with the education and business and the outcomes are, are not quite uh, acceptable. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, came out in the film uh, about uh, te preparing teachers and, and treating them as professionals is something that we've really failed to do in Indiana. Uh, we expect a professional level of work from teachers, and yet when you compare uh, the financial reward that teachers get in comparison to other professionals, we, far, we fall far behind. Uh, a teacher with a master's degree uh, earns about $30,000 less than a comparable professional in another professional field uh, on an annual basis. Uh, there's a, that great bridge there. I think we fail to draw a lot of qualified people into education we're failing to draw the people who really belong in education. Uh, we're not competing with business for the, for, the, uh, for the talent that's out there. Before we move on from the whole issue of, of how you test and how you interpret the tests, uh, can, you, can some of you just help me with how you think it ought to be? Uh, Roy, what, what is... The, what is your perception of the best way to evaluate what students are doing and whether they're performing up to speed? Well, much of the direction of both teacher preparation and K-12 education focuses on performance and looking at multiple assessments, not just a single indicator performance. And I think that's the best way to measure the true value of one's uh, education. What are they, the multiple measures? Well, there, if you look back just a few year ago, years ago, the Business College and uh, the uh, Muncie Chamber of Commerce conducted a study of high school graduates in this community. And the focus of the report was that the students being prepared by the local schools, in terms of what we traditionally measure as basic skills, did very well. It was in the area of soft skills, 
communication skills, being able to work cooperative and collaboratively with others, and those kind of indicators that the report said we weren't doing as well. And so as we move into the kind of technological age we are, the ways in which we thought about how people might perform on the job are radically changing. While competition was important on single measures of performance, uh, group activity leading to a product that requires creativity, uh, critical thinking, collaboration, cooperation, uh, really reshaped the way in which education is moving, in my opinion. We want to remind everybody in the audience that you have an opportunity to uh, join us with questions. And those of you who are listening by radio or viewing on television, please uh, uh, bring your calls in. We have some already. I'm going to be sharing the first of those. Uh, the number to call, 747-4949. Get to your telephone and join in. This is your opportunity to be part of a live town meeting. Uh, first question for Carol D'Amico. You've identified a number of problems. What are the solutions? Uh, <laughs> why didn't we start with an easy one? Uh, the, the solutions, in my view, are, are multifaceted. First of all, we have to increase the expectations we have for students in this state. Uh, we require a ninth grade level test to earn your diploma. Uh, a ninth grade level of education is insufficient to be prepared for uh, further education and a job. Yes, you have to pass all your courses, but what we've said in Indiana is if you prove you have a ninth grade level of education, you can go out the door and be, be ready. That's too low. Uh, so we need to ratchet up our expectations. Uh, we do need to reward good teachers. I agree. Good teachers are not paid enough money. Now, we need to distinguish between the good and the not so good. And we need to figure out how we're going to get that done. Because I know that teachers um, uh, resent the ones in their schools who are not pulling their own weight. And we need to, to identify those good teachers and reward them and get the ones who are not doing the job out of there. All right, Greg Holzer, uh, how do you respond to that? Oh, I would respond to that, that back in 1973 when I entered uh, college as a student in education, I was hearing that exact same thing. Uh, what an opportunity we had. We were at the time period when we were going to make the changeover. We were going to professionalize education. And here we are uh, 27 years later, uh, and we haven't changed. In order for us to do what Hudson has proposed, going to a merit pay system, uh, there's got to be the money to pay that merit. And so far, our state hasn't made any kind of commitment to go that direction. All right, so I would really seriously challenge whether or not a system like that would work uh, when there won't be sufficient funds available to do that in the first place. Since you raised the issue of merit pay, uh, there certainly are strong feelings among many teachers that that's not the way to go. What's your feeling? Well, I have gone both ways on this in my professional career. I think uh, a lot of that would have to do with the way that we treat merit pay. Uh, if we're going to simply allow a, a single person within the, com the uh, school corporation to determine which teachers are effective uh, and which are not using some sort of subjective measurement, uh, I'm not really sure that we can always get a fair assessment. Uh, if we only assess using the objective testing, uh, methods that we presently have, I think what happens is, is we measure a teacher by the students that he has, and that may not always be a, a fair assessment of the teacher's ability either. Uh, so far, teachers have not been presented with an evaluation tool to determine which are the good teachers and which are the bad teachers to determine merit pay, and I think they're against it because they aren't being given an effective method for making that evaluation. Martin yeah, I, I agree yeah. with that. I, um, I don't think an evaluation tool can just use one method. I think it should be on student achievement. That's the bottom line. Did a student learn anything from this teacher this year? And that's what we have to figure out how to do and reward those who do a good job of adding that achievement to that student. And there are ways to do that. That's, that, that's not a hard thing to do. But we should also look at peer review. We should look at uh, the principal's evaluation. There should be multiple measures. But the bottom line is student achievement. Did that teacher teach each and every one of those students something this year? And to what extent? Marlon Creasy, you've been at every level of this uh, profession. Uh, and you're now in a position where you do have to evaluate. Mm -hmm. and uh, I, I would not be a proponent of merit pay. <clears throat> I would much prefer to see a method where we can make either <clears throat> the average teacher a better teacher or make sure that teacher isn't there. And I don't think we have an easy avenue of doing that. I think the majority of teachers we have are very good teachers. 
We concentrate, though, we spend so much of our resources on, on trying to get those out, and we're not very successful at that because of, of really uh, the bureaucratic setup that we have in our state. So I'm not in favor of merit pay. I am in favor of rewarding those doing the job, but I'd like to be able to have all of them do the job. Once again, a reminder that we are taking telephone calls from our viewers and listeners, and the number you can call is 747-4949. As a parent, Mr. Yes, Bell, please. I was under the impression that Indiana paid a lot in taxes for their educational system, for the public schools. Um, so when I think of the pay, I mean, I, good teachers probably are not paid enough. But I agree that we should try to some way filter those teachers out who aren't doing a good job. Maybe it comes at the beginning when they're going to school to learn how to be teachers. Um, certainly something has to be addressed there. And as a parent, I would like to see us work together with the parents, the administrators, the teachers, work together for what's good for the kids rather than worrying about a lot of things. We're talking about things that really don't relate to the kids. And it seems to me they're getting the raw end of this. Roy Weaver, when it comes to evaluating teachers rather than students, uh, where should the focus be? I think it has to be at a variety of levels. Uh, one, I think each teacher has some responsibility for demonstrating that his or her students does in fact learn important skills and values during the year. I think every teacher ought to be expected to do that. At the same time, I too am concerned about the issue of incentives, and I may be getting back off the top, this topic. No, no, that, it's all um, part of the same topic. The one I'm headed to is one I want to answer, and it's easier to avoid your question that way. So. <laughs> uh, but clearly, I, I think Indiana is headed toward a, a crisis in terms of uh, the availability of high quality teachers coming out of teacher ed institutions. Indiana is an export state, first of all. And uh, for example, on May the 3rd, 103 school corporations from across the country will be on our campus recruiting our students, who I would argue are among the best in the country. Uh, my point though is that Indiana has not taken the initiative that other states have taken. The state of Maryland, for example, offers a 5% housing loan for new teachers coming to Maryland. Uh, school corporations are paying significant bonuses, moving expenses, other incentives that Indiana isn't talking about very seriously. And so I think if there is a crisis ahead, it's one that uh, we're not considering very seriously and will have a profound impact on the future quality of teaching in the schools and the achievement of our students. On top of that, another thing Indiana does not do that many states do is to have a program where career professionals can teach in school uh, while working toward getting their full credential. Uh, in this state, the top chemist at Eli Lilly and Company, where I live in Indianapolis, uh, the top chemist could not teach chemistry in the high school. That person could teach chemistry at the two-year technical school or at I Indiana University, uh, in Indianapolis, but that person could not teach at the local high school. Um, a person who is, is fluent in Spanish uh, cannot teach Spanish in high school. That person teaches at Ivy Tech, that person teaches at IU, but cannot teach at the high school. We have got to get the best and the brightest into our schools and make it easy for the best and the brightest. And we don't do that in Indiana. Carol, can I respond to that? Because I have heard that many times, and on the surface that sounds very uh, very simple to do. What I would propose, though, is that I'm a biology teacher in high school. I know significantly less biology than the professors who taught me in college, but yet they would not survive in a high school classroom. They don't understand instruction of high school students. They don't understand multiple intelligences. They understand biology. They were some of the poorest teachers that I ever worked with. It's not a matter of being a professional and knowing your area that makes you a good teacher. It's understanding multiple intelligences. It's understanding instructional strategies and techniques. It's understanding classroom management that these professionals may not necessarily possess, and it makes them unfit to be teachers in the classroom. Now, I'm not saying that they're all unfit, 
But what I'm saying is just the assumption that because they're professional in the field makes them qualified to be a teacher is, is not an acceptable. Uh, right. And on the other hand, just knowing instructional strategies and not knowing your subject doesn't make a good teacher either. Well, <laughs> Marlon Creasy, you're the person who has to mediate this. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, no, I, I agree with the last assessment. Uh, uh, simply knowing strategies doesn't, doesn't make you a good teacher. Um, but, I, but I also know that if you take certain people from the field and just put them into classroom without preparation, uh, they're not going to have a great deal of success. I agree with Carol. We need to make the avenue easier, though. There are many people who would like to enter education or go from one level to the other, and because of the rules and regulations, can't do it. They would have to have two to three years of co additional college work. Uh, so we have, <clears throat> Dean Weaver pointed out that we're losing a lot of people in the end, and we are. We, our particular school corporation has Ball State within it, and we have difficulty attracting people because they can go out of state, they are getting bonuses, but we have some, some highly qualified people who would, who would be willing to work with the schools if they could only get a license. We have a question from the audience. Okay, this question goes back to merit pay, and I was wondering, is merit pay an incentive for teachers to do better, or is it a reward for teachers who are already doing well? And sort of a second question to that, is if merit pay isn't a good idea, the teachers don't like it, what else can we do to reward teachers besides pay? All right. Can Greg, I, how would you like I'll to be ahead. rewarded? <laughs> uh, I, to, to respond to the first part, I think it's probably both. You're, you're rewarding teachers who are presently doing well, and you're going to continue to reward teachers as they improve. Um, could you rephrase the second part of your question then for me, please? Uh, the second part of my question is, if we don't use merit pay, what can we use to reward teachers? Well, I think what we do is we create a system where we, we create teachers, a group of teachers who are only people who are deserving of the merit pay. And then we pay them all as, a prof as professionals. Uh, I think what Dr. Creasy said earlier about eliminating teachers who don't belong in the profession, just as we would, we would hopefully weed out doctors who don't belong in the profession or any other profession. Uh, and then we have just a pool of people who are all qualified and who all are uh, deserving of the merit. Uh, so, you know, some of, the, some of the problems that I see with that are that you pit teachers against one another until you have a process in which you make all teachers worthy of the merit. And then there's no problem. I don't yep. understand, yes. though, why teachers are different than other professions. I've worked in several organizations, very different organizations. I get evaluated as a prof professional. I may or may not like my manager's assessment of my abilities, but that's, you know, that person's assessment. And I get rewarded based on that assessment. Because I'm rewarded on my performance, that doesn't make me any less likely to work with my colleagues. It doesn't, I guess I don't understand what's so uniquely different about teaching than it is in a college situation, or is it any business at all? And when I say treating teachers as professionals, I want them to be treated like lawyers and accountants and uh, professionals very similarly trained and licensed. Um, and I guess I don't understand what's so inherently different about teaching. Well, I think it goes back to the limited funding that's available. Well, no, let's business, set this straight. We're, let's, we're let's, the 14th highest straight. spending okay. state in but the country. But we're not, spending, we're we're not spending it on our teachers. No, we're not spending it on our teachers. And that's what has to change. Now, exactly what, I, what, what I would propose to, to you is, and, and my father came from a business background, if he wanted a person in his business or if he wanted to reward a person, he could come up with the money for that. In education, if we're going to come up with the money for teachers, in a merit pay situation, we're going to take it from another teacher. And that's where the adversarial situation comes in. We won't do that in any other business, but we would gladly do it in education. And unfortunately, that's why the merit pay system, as it's been proposed in a lot of cases, will not work, is because in order to give it to one, you've got to take it from another. Well, wouldn't you want to give it to the good and take it from the bad? I'm still a little confused. I don't understand. But, agree, but what you were asking about was how you create an adversarial situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's, I understand. You know. I don't understand that just in education it's so different, that you'd be taking it away from another teacher to give it to the good teacher. Marlon, the, you want to get in here? I don't understand there, that. There, there, we only have a limited amount of money that we can that we can spend on education. But every organization has a limit. That's you correct, can't go out we're and talking, make... no, we, we, are, we are limited by the state on how much we can increase our particular budget, and that's fine, we live with that. 
but if I was going to develop any type of system that's going to reward one, it's going to have to come from someplace within the organization, so it will be taken away from somebody else. The, the vast majority of our money goes to salary and benefits, 90 plus percent, so there is no other pool. We don't have the resources, we don't have the additional resources that one could do it. My, my whole objective on being here is for my child and for the children. And all I'm hearing us talking about is pay for the teachers. And it seems to me we, if we would all be working together for the good of those people, we wouldn't be worrying about all these other things. It seems to me that a person goes into education, I would hope, because they love the kids, because they want to be a good teacher. I would hope they're not going into it for the money. <laughs> Maybe they are. Maybe for the, the merit pay. I don't know. Well, but I, I would I, agree with you. I would agree with you, Karen. I went into education because I love children, just like my doctor went into medicine because he enjoys taking care of people. But he can name his own price. Well, so does that follow then? I the think we're, you know, I don't think I don't think because he makes more money, he doesn't care. Right. Well, let's take our next question from the audience. <laughs> well, I, I happen to be Karen's husband, but I'm a different person. I'm from the third world, educated in a liberal system with very strict tests. I had to pass a high school test. And before going to college, I had to take a test in the college I wanted to go to. To get to high school, I had to take an admission test to the school of my choice. I was tested every year. And if I fail a subject, I to take it again the next year, and I survive. But one of the things that's happened here is it takes three school administrators and professionals to balance a concerned parent. And that's why we have the problems in the schools. The kids don't matter except as numbers to get revenue. We talk about salaries, we talk about accreditations, we talk about licensing, we talk about all kinds of different things we do. We produce. Uh, Teachers are producing hams over at the teachers' college. It's, it's okay, but half of the teachers we produce are not able to perform in the classroom. They pass the test in psychology, they pass the test in materials and whatever, but they cannot do it in the classroom. Right. But one of the things I'm asking here, and I'm looking at, I have a bunch of notes here, and I get a little annoyed about it because we have all these agendas. And we did redefine this stuff, no crisis, but you know, the question is, would you be willing, teachers, administrators, and the school boards, to get together with the parents and basically sign a contract with the children of Delaware County in which you're going to put your differences aside? I get offended when the president of the teacher union tells me I'm stupid, okay. I don't know anything about the other professionals. So would you be willing to put down your agendas okay. and come together and say, we are going to work for the children. My children, my, my, kid, my kid is out of school, effective next right. year. Other kids are going out. And you have a very high rate of dropout in high school. And all those guys, I mean, I have so much right, stuff to say. Marlon, would, would you bottom. please uh, take that question? Well, I, I think you, know, you probably have a lot more power than what you think, because <clears throat> as a community, I, I, we talked about how are we going to improve. The first thing, you have to demand improvement. I agree with that. Uh, I think you have to establish standards, and I agree with that. I think you're seeing that, and I'm familiar with, and Steve, I am familiar with all the schools in Muncie, Delaware County. I think the standards have to be there, and I, have to, and I think the community has to say, we'll accept nothing less than the standards. All right, let's, it does take let, the fair involvement. Uh, let's just start now. We've, we've discussed a lot about what our problems are, what our challenges are. Uh, let's, let's focus now on opportunities. Uh, Roy Weaver, what are our opportunities right now? Where can we be going? What can we be doing that will make a difference? Well, I think there's a convergence of reform in K-12 education and teacher preparation uh, that's bringing public school teachers and university faculty together in ways never before. Uh, we have approximately 17 professional development schools uh, hoping to move toward 23 to 25 within the next few months. These are very different ways of looking at teacher preparation in public education. It's much more intensive. Uh, our students and our faculty from the university and their schools on a much regular basis, they're agreed upon goals that they work toward. I think that's one initiative. Going back to a point Carol made earlier, and I think there's some misconception about this. 
I think universities have great autonomy for creating alternative programs for licensing. For example, we're starting a cohort group of 21, 22 students this summer who have bachelor's degree but no license who want to be elementary school teachers. In 15 months, as a cohort group, they will graduate with elementary licenses. So I think that universities need to look at ways that they can address the shortage. Interestingly, places like California, Utah, New York, and Florida are flying to Europe to hire math and science teachers. I mean, that's one approach, and it's a real uh, effort that's on their way. So let's not lose sight of the fact that there are other alternative routes to filling classrooms with, with teachers. So I think those are interesting initiatives. I go back to the fact that I think already this community has put aside its differences for four or five years to look at ways, first and foremost, to support families at birth, to make sure that families not only understand what they always had about the physical development of children, but what are the, the resources in the community that can help the intellectual development for every child. And I think those are three quick uh, opportunities that we have that we're taking advantage of and working toward. So is there no hope for my child? who's going into high school. I mean, we're in, a, we're in a bad shape now in the high school. Uh, there really isn't a lot of time left for him, for us all to get our act together. I, I might respond. We said earlier about establishing standards. I, I think we saw, and I am going to concentrate now just on Muncie for just for a few moments. <clears throat> we demanded improvement, period. We said uh, we can deal with certain people directly, and that's the ones who are running the schools. And we said you're going to improve, period in every area. Muncie, for the first time in, in, I believe, six years, all the schools were above the 50th NCE because we refused to accept any less. We've told every school, not only are you going to improve, but you're going to improve next year. So is it happening? Yes. We had a terrible rate, a terrible graduation rate that in a two-year period of time went from 74 at Central to 89. Uh, and it's because we said, we're holding you accountable. We're holding ourselves accountable. We're holding accountable. Is there hope? Yes. I, I think the schools are, 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 are recognizing we have to improve. The criticism that's being given, given of Indiana schools, we readily accept. Some of us readily accept. But let us go in and make the improvement. And then, but it takes, <clears throat> Dean Weaver talked about uh, the CAPE initiative locally. And <clears throat> we're to the point now where we're involving everyone. The parent who said, uh, why don't you involve the parents? That's what we're trying to do right now and we're saying come forward. It's going to take a community compact. Uh, the goal is no, no kid quits in, in Muncie, Delaware County. It's not Muncie, it's Muncie, Delaware County. And it's, it's going to work if we all say it's going to work. Gray, if you had a wish list for improving things fast, what would you do? A wish list for improving things fast. Uh, I really think that we need to develop partnerships within our community. Uh, partnerships with parents, partnerships with the other stakeholders that we have, the businesses who are going to be accepting our children uh, as their workforce. Uh, we need to get the civic groups involved with our schools. Uh, ultimately, as Karen said, you know, we've got to work for the children, and, and we have gotten some sidetracking here in our, in our conversation tonight, but I also, think, I also think that that's relevant to children as well. Uh, but the partnerships, I think, are absolutely essential. Uh, because where funding perhaps falls short, uh, there are resources within our community that can make up for those shortfalls if we develop those kinds of partnerships. Uh, we've got companies coming into Yorktown now that are going to provide us with technologies that we can't afford, but they're willing to give to us in order to improve our educational situation. Now there's a, ultimately a profit for them, and I think businesses have to see where in the long term there is a profit for them to foster education and with those partnerships. We have a question from the audience. My name is Alan Bramlett. I'm with the uh, best training program, building employment skills together through Ball State University. It's a pre-apprenticeship training through the building construction trades. And when we talk about partnerships, that's what we're involved in. We have some probably 15 or 20 partnerships in this training program. The problem we've had in the past in the building construction trades is when we get the applicants to our programs, we have a simple math, general math, general algebra, general geometry test, and we're having people fail that test by 30 to 40 percent out of high school. What we've done with this, the best training program basically is, is we, it's a pre-apprentice training program. We prepare these individuals 
during this time period, a two-year program, uh, to take that apprenticeship test. We work on math, we work on algebra, we work on geometry, and it's been successful. We have five children right now, or five, not children, five kids uh, from the Munster Community Schools working with us, uh, juniors and seniors, and we have worked through the building trades with approximately 60 or 70 unemployed, dislocated workers throughout the area. So the, the thing that, the question I guess I have is, it seems to me like we have more people in training after high school than we do in high school. We're doing a lot of training afterwards for simple things that I feel like should be done within the school. The second thing is some place along the line, we've got to get the parents involved. That's where education starts is at home. And we're, for some reason, we're not getting that message across. What can be done along that line? You, you know, you're absolutely right. In the building trades, you've got a huge problem. You've got a sh shortage of people who you're going to be able to even attract, and let alone quality. You do a great job of bringing people up to, to reading and math level. I've got to really hand it to the trade unions. But you shouldn't have to. And in our colleges, I'm not speaking about Ball State because I don't know, but in many of our colleges in this state, entering level freshmen need about 30 to 40 hours of math and reading before they can even start college level work. About 30 to 40 percent of, of entering freshmen need some remediation. So the colleges are redoing the work of the high schools, trade unions, employers are spending millions of dollars on remedial education. It adds to the cost of doing business. Um, and we've got to stop that. We, don't, we won't have that luxury with the shortage of people we're going to have in this state. Again, I think the answer is people working together as partnerships that's been mentioned here before. Well, it's kind of hard, and I won't be defensive on this. I think the state of Indiana recognized we haven't been producing what we need to produce. The graduate qualification exam, whether one likes it or not, whether it's a freshman level, does set a benchmark. We, we know, those who, who have followed in Indiana legislation know that the Educational Roundtable, a group of 30 people now, are recommending extremely tougher standards for the state of Indiana. I think that part of the, it may be simplistic, and Indiana has to establish the standards on the state level, and I think that's fine, and then demand that, that we produce the product. I would suggest, you know, we, we saw, and I'll go to Muncie since we had the worst scores, our initial sophomore graduation exam was terrible, absolutely terrible. But as of two years later, we're now at 88% of the students who have completed it, Indiana's at 83%. It doesn't make me feel good. It makes me feel a lot better, though, than the 45% we had two years ago. Uh, Indiana needs to toughen the standards. I totally agree they need to toughen the standards. I am one of the few, by the way, that's all for the standardized testing because I think it not only compares us in-state but out-of-state, since we're not just Indiana, uh, but establish them and hold us accountable. A question from the audience? Uh, has there been a census or statistic in a... Um, Increase in the number of teachers needed in this area? Increase in the number of teachers needed? Do we have enough? Well, there are shortage areas in math, science, and special ed in particular. Uh -huh. in those three areas. Uh, I think in the last five years, Ball State has produced maybe three physics teachers, maybe seven in the state of Indiana, something like that. Uh, there's a critical shortage in math and science and special education right now. We have a, yeah. It's immediate yeah. in, in Indiana. Yeah. We have another question from the audience. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to look at this as a little more positive attitude and compliment this gentleman for his remarks. Uh, we've all heard of the uh, contract with America. Uh, why couldn't we in Muncie and Delaware County and each school corporation have a, a contract to meet this lady's immediate problem where the students sign the contract, the parents sign the contract, the teachers signed the contract to meet some levels immediately. Next school year, we all agree, we all sign our name. We're students, we're parents, we're educators. Then, I think we as taxpayers wouldn't mind having another two, three, or four cents on our tax rate to pay these teachers if they meet those goals. They're going to have to all work together then. Parents, with the students, with the educators, then the educators and we as taxpayers would pay them that bonus. We're coming down to our last uh, 10 minutes, and I want to be sure here that anybody uh, who has a solution in mind uh, 
has, uh, has the opportunity to voice it. Uh, but uh, unless you take the initiative, I'm going to go ahead with several. Yes. Go. I just wanted to agree with this gentleman that it is going to take us all working together. And I think that the parents really need to get involved a lot more. Uh, I don't know if it, that's because they're getting something from the educators saying, we don't need you. I don't know if that's the deal or not. But I definitely think we all have to work together for the good of our kids. I agree with that, gentlemen. What's the teacher attitude toward parental involvement? We hear that there's a lack of it. I heard they didn't want us involved, really. Uh, and they quite, didn't need us. Quite the contrary. I, I, I don't know where, perhaps, perhaps the schools that you, your children have been associated it, with, I don't know. Uh, quite the contrary, in our corporation, we relish parent involvement. Uh, there are limited amounts of things that parents can do because uh, we do have to hold the parents accountable for whatever actions they take if they're in our building working with students. I, I, uh, we, we relish having parents become involved. We know for a fact, research indicates that parents who are involved with their children's education uh, have children who achieve right. better. Uh, I think what we have in some cases are parents who do not become involved for whatever reasons. The school has turned them off for whatever reasons. Uh, I don't really believe that schools intentionally go out to try to turn parents away uh, or try to turn parents against the school or try to, to insinuate that parents uh, don't have a role in their child's education. Um, I think we need to define what parent involvement is. It's really hard for parents to be involved when they don't really understand what their child is expected to learn or where his or her child is. They get these incomprehensible reports from ISTEP. These are not local school corporations that do this. This is from the state. I mean, when they get a, a report from ISTEP, they, it says your child is in the 99th percentile. Mm -hmm. Most parents, they don't know what that means. What does that mean? Uh, what does it mean compared to what my child should know? Is my child learning what he or she needs to know to be successful? And most school corporations, I'm not talking about yours, do not do a very good job of informing parents what their child should be learning and how their child is going towards those goals. School corporations and are grades don't mean anything. A's and B's don't mean anything anymore. School corporations that are that are effectively working with parents do invite parents in. They go through the I step score sheet, explain what percentile is. Yeah. They meet with the parents. Not only do they show them the I steps, but they show them the daily work that the child is doing. They show them where the child is succeeding and where they're not. Uh, I've been involved with several school corporations where that's done, and is that, it's been very successful. Is this the way to go? Well, I think that's what he's talking about is a common approach that schools use within Muncie, Delaware County. All right, we have uh, another question from the black microphone, please. My name is Steve Anderson, and there have been several references to a community alliance to uh, promote education, and I had the privilege of chairing that committee. And I can only say that the themes that have come out here tonight are underway in the way we're attempting to develop a compact or a contract for community-based, for a community-supported learning environment. We've just won a $50,000 grant from the Lilly Endowment for planning the development of a community compact. And I think, folks, that's going to force us to put our money where our mouth is. We do have an opportunity to come together. There are 27 organizations representing a wide spectrum of the community that's coming together on a common theme. And that theme simply is, there isn't such a thing as other people's kids. There are. Anyone want to comment on that? Another question from the red microphone. Uh, just a comment first, I'm not sure that it's as broken as you think it is. Um, the brain drain that you talk about, that we all know about, belies the fact that we're not doing our job here in Indiana. If uh, all the other states in this union are drawing away our top talent, is it because they're so poorly educated? I don't think so. That's just a comment. Uh, the other thing I think it's important to keep in mind is that parents are first teachers. We all take that on when we become parents. And you all haven't talked about that a lot. You talked about it a little. There is a strong correlation between two parent families and the success of children in schools. And uh, some years ago when we started the Sesame Street uh, Preschool Educational Project, we were very aware that uh, 
uh, in the mid part of the century, uh, the last century, I guess it is now, uh, 40, 50 percent of the parents, uh, of, the, of the mothers at least, of children of, pre of preschool age were home with their kids, and it's less than 20 percent now. And that's a huge factor. And I, I guess what I would comment and, and ask you to comment on is what can we do about that role that's changed? And uh, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm excited about the, uh, the uh, initiative Steve talked about because we do need to look at it differently. We can't just say it's education's fault, it's the school's fault, they're failing. We're leaving our children at home, we're leaving them in other environments, and we're going off to work in greater numbers than ever before. I don't think that's going to change. We need some kind of outside-the-box solution, in my opinion. Can we pick up on that question about the role that parents have to play? Because that's certainly something that uh, here we have a parent saying, I want the opportunity for more involvement. But certainly from one of Roy's early comments, uh, part of the problem is that in many cases, we don't have parental involvement. Well, I think low cost, easily accessible, high quality child care is one of the most critical challenges we face in this community, in the state and nation. Uh, a child is not responsible to whom he or she is born and to what kind of environment he or she finds himself. And so I'm deeply concerned about families who cannot afford the kind of support that's absolutely critical for that child's success. And so whose obligation is it? And I think Steve is saying it is this community's obligation to find a way to assure that every child has some equity early on in opportunity to achieve. Uh, Marlon, we have less than a minute left, and I'd just like to ask you if you could say to parents, hey, here's what you ought to be doing to help us do our job, what would you say in 30 seconds? Sure, a parent <laughs> has to be involved with, with their child, and I think a parent has to know that they can go to the school and become a part of the school. We've heard from two parents that have to be part from our school system tonight, and one of our goals is to have parents involved in the school, and they told us they don't feel like they should be. So Steve, I think we have to go back and see what we're not doing. Uh, Thank you very much, all of you, for participating with us tonight. And thank you for being our viewers, all of you in our audience, for participating in this town meeting. After a brief break, we'll continue Muncie at the Millennium, the town meeting, our topic for the second hour, images and attitudes. Live from the new Community Civic Center in downtown Muncie, Indiana, this is Muncie at the Millennium, a town meeting, a unique opportunity for community dialogue. Now, here's your moderator, Steve Bell. Welcome back to Muncie at the Millennium, a town meeting. For any of you just joining us tonight, our focus is on Muncie's challenges and opportunities at the beginning of a new millennium. Our topic for the second hour tonight, images and attitudes. What about Muncie's past reputation for government turmoil and a divided community? How do we plan effectively for the future? And how do we find a community consensus? Before we introduce our panel of experts and community leaders, let's take a look at where we stand today as the greater Muncie area considers its challenges and opportunities. Tom Hammond of WLBC Radio has a report. Police relations with residents of the Muncieana and the Whiteley neighborhoods. It's not the only example of the deep distrust that have often polarized the Muncie area, but it symbolizes the problems. Residents have safety concerns. I don't want any, you know, shootings and stuff on the playgrounds and a lot of bad drugs being sold and stuff. But there is also concern that justice is not always fairly administered. Former state representative Hurley Goodall. They go in with an iron fist in Muncieana. And I think it's a totally different mindset determined on what areas they're policing. Joe Winkle is Muncie's police chief. We're a young department. Some of them are just learning how to do it. I mean, this job is not one of those jobs where you can come in and a year or two into it have the answers. 
I mean, it takes a long time to understand how to deal with people of all different races and ages and um, educational backgrounds, financial backgrounds. In fact, racial divisions in Muncie have a chilling past. For a time, an active Ku Klux Klan attacked and intimidated Catholics and Jews as well as black residents. Bruce Gielhood heads Middletown Studies at Ball State. It was the idea that you could enforce a certain mentality relative to Americanism that did not rec recognize the emergence, even then, of a very pluralistic society. It was not a pleasant place to grow up as a black youngster with the lines that were drawn. But Muncie's divisions go far beyond race. Historically, there has been a deep divide between Northwest and the more industrial working class Southeast. Muncie is divided geographically by the White River. Those two elements do not, shall we say, mix effectively in a social sense. And historically, the city has had a reputation for raucous and often corrupt government. City Councilman Jim Carey remembers his early days on the police force. I went on the police department in 1949. At that point in time, it was uh, probably 25 whorehouses and get wide open gambling and this and that. Political scientist Ray Sheely. Not only do we have that reputation, but uh, many people here in uh, Muncie that are natives uh, are proud of it. Today, city and county government have a more benign reputation, but it's still tough going for a Republican mayor and a Democratic council majority. Mayor Dan Cannon. The biggest problem, I guess, working with the city council is communication. It's important to communicate with them. Democrat Bruce Weimer is council president. There's two things you got to have. you got to have cooperation and then... In turn, you're going to have communication. And if you have communication, you can get anything done. Heavy job losses in the high-paying industrial sector have served as a wake-up call for many area leaders. Sometimes it's just real sober shocks that have to happen to a community for, for some goodwill to start coming out so that we start working together instead of dividing. But the big test may be long-range planning. Urban sprawl and haphazard development are reminders that a master plan approved in the 1970s has had little impact. Eric Kelly is an urban planner. For too many years, I think Muncie and Delaware County have been willing to accept whatever development comes along. One of the bright spots has been beautification projects, especially along the White River. Marge Ziegler has led much of the effort. We used to have much opposition. Now people want to do things. A new master plan was unveiled at a well-attended meeting last year with specific goals and requirements. But will it be enforced? Marta Moody is executive director of the Planning Commission. The plan needs to be applied in whole as much as possible. Don't just take a, a piece here and a piece there to try to support your particular point of view. The plan's emphasis is on orderly, regulated development westward along Highway 332 connecting Northwest Muncie with I-69, the goal to limit congestion and commercialization. Newly widened Highway 67 also is seen as a corridor for planned development and for renewal of South Muncie. Ed Kananser is a Delaware County Commissioner. What we're looking at is a plan that will give us the ability to have uh, orderly development, have planned development over the next 25 years so that we can we can actually plan for the residential, commercial, and industrial growth in Muncie and Delaware County. Annexation also is a volatile issue. Targeted residents and businesses don't trust the city, but the city sees another problem. They want all the benefits of the city. They want to use our parks. They want to use our streets. They want to work in our city and make their money. But then they want to run out just outside and, and live. And what about proposals like the Duke Power Plant and other development ideas? They often trigger a reaction called NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's partly a symptom of sprawl. If you look at a map of Delaware County, there is enough scattered development that if you have something that might be unpopular, like a power plant or a prison or something, there is almost no place to put it in Delaware County where it won't have neighbors. Ultimately, the question is, how do we get together for the good of all? The hardest thing in Muncie, Indiana to do is to build a consensus. And on that note, let's meet our panelists. Eric Kelly, as an urban planner at Ball State University, active in developing a new master plan for Delaware County.
Shirley Goodall, former state legislator and longtime community leader, one of the first two African Americans on the Muncie Fire Department. Dan Cannon, mayor of Muncie, a Republican, recently reelected despite major gains for the Democrats in other contests. Dennis Tyler, county chairman of the Democratic Party, presided over a Democratic Party that appears unified for the first time in some years, and he's also president of the Muncie Firefighters Union. Beverly Pitts, associate provost at Ball State University, who's also taking a leadership role in community activities. And Larry Law, editor of the Muncie Star, who writes a fascinating column for those of us who've had a journalism background, a column all about the complaints that the news media gets and why the paper does what it does. And right now we'd like to remind all of you uh, who are listening on radio or who are watching on television to please uh, take part in this town meeting. This is your opportunity to call in and to be a part of our program. We have two numbers for you to call, 747 Five nine, or is that four nine? Four nine. Seven four seven four nine four nine and one eight hundred two five two nine four seven two. We welcome your calls for our panelists. Eric Kelly, you're in a dual role here tonight. Uh, although you're now very much a part of this community, uh, you are an urban planner who uh, count who advises uh, companies, communities all across the country. Uh, you know what they look for. Uh, let's just start by asking if somebody outside who really hasn't done their homework is looking in at Muncie uh, just on the basis of the reputation that's out there, uh, what are they seeing? I think what we often forget in Muncie is that we really are an old auto parts, blue collar, industrial community. And that's fundamentally what Muncie, Indiana is. And that's mostly what people see looking at it. We have many resources that go beyond that. We have a wonderful university. We have a symphony. We have the Masterworks Chorale. We have a terrific children's museum. There are many resources here, but those aren't the first things that people see. Now, there are strengths and weaknesses in seeing that. The strength in the old blue collar working class community is that it's family oriented. It's a good place to live. It's a safe place to live. It's a good place to rear your family. And that's a terrific strength. But it isn't a glitzy kind of community that attracts some of the modern industry. And in many ways, we have many of the same assets as those glitzy communities, but we don't necessarily have that image. And I think that comes back to your program tonight, images and attitudes, that some of the things that people in the community look at constantly, some of our real strengths. And then I think there are people in South Muncie and East Muncie who sometimes think some of these institutions are too dominant and get too much attention in the community are almost unknown outside the community, because outside the community, we look like blue-collar, industrial, working-class community. Mayor Cannon? I would tend to agree with Eric. I think uh, we get labeled where we were years ago, which was predominantly industrial, as, as a lot of the cities were throughout the um, Midwest. We are obviously changing from that. We have more diversity in our industrial base here. We have lost some of our industrial base, which has been bad for our community. But there are lots of assets. There's lots of people that are working together in our community right now. Um, Eric mentioned a lot of them. And we have lots of positives going on in our community. I think our job is to sell those assets and let people aware that there are lots of positives in Muncie. I know as economic development projects are developing throughout the community and as the Vision 2001 team is working on that, they can get somebody in here with incentives and they can bring them in here maybe with some land or maybe a spec building that's sitting there. But in order to get them here and get them to stay here and get them interested in bringing um, employees here or bringing management staff here and then hiring employees in our community, they then start looking at quality of life issues. They start looking at the, the amenities that are involved in our community. And like Eric said, I think we have lots of great assets. Some he didn't mention, Prairie Creek Reservoir. Um, Lots of good things that are going on, uh, but we have to sell ourselves a little bit. I think we've done in the past. We talk about that history. Uh, Hurley, you grew up in this community, and uh, let's face it, when, when I came here, uh, the first thing I heard was, oh, Muncie's divided. Uh, you've got div divisions <clears throat> along the White River between north and south. Uh, you've got divisions politically that have uh, oftentimes paralyzed the city. You've got divisions racially, uh, like almost every other community of this size and larger. Uh, let's, let's talk just a moment about the history, and uh, I want to get everybody involved here. But uh, where was, where is Muncie coming from? Well, I've thought about this, had a chance since last week to sit and talk about it, and I'm certainly happy we have a chance to do it because I think this may be 
the one opportunity we'll get to look at our community honestly and do some evaluating and hopefully move forward. But I see Muncie basically as two different communities. And it's just as divided socially and economically as it is racially. And I think if we aren't honest and straight up with ourselves, I don't think relationships between labor people and the business community is near as, as good as it's been presented uh, here. And I think labor has got a pretty bad rap over the years because there were two sides in those labor disputes back there. And I don't think one side has accepted much responsibility for the image that has been created. So I think we have a lot of things to talk about and a lot of problems to deal with. And uh, hopefully we can get to some of those later this evening. Dennis Tyler? I talked to Hurley last week after the, uh, the uh, first sessions that you had. And he told me he wasn't going to pull any punches tonight. <laughs> and it looks like he is. Uh, uh, I tend to agree with Hurley on, on uh, a lot of the, uh, the labor relations and, and, and the aspects of that is, is uh, labor has taken a bad rap in this community for a number of years. And, and for whatever reason, I don't know, because in any labor relation dispute, there's always, there has to be a dispute on both sides for that to work. And, uh, and it's always been labor's stance that we, that we haven't gotten a fair shake at, at a number of different times and, and uh, when all they wanted was just to, to be heard. Uh, the political divides, you're going to have political divides in any community at any time. I mean, that, that's why you have a two-party system and it works very well and it creates the checks and balances you need in, 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 in the beliefs. But I do believe that once you get through the political side of it then and the elections are over, then you have to work for the for the better of the community, and, and I see a lot of that going on right now. Beverly Pitts, uh, you have a unique perspective in that you grew up down the road uh, in the Anderson area, and uh, so you've had, a, you've had a look at two communities. You've been very much a part of two communities that in many ways may not be dissimilar. Uh, are, we, uh, are we beating ourselves when we don't deserve it, or uh, do we have a unique problem in this community? Well, actually, it is interesting to have this perspective because I did spend a number of years in Anderson before coming to the Muncie community and Ball State. And my perceptions of Muncie uh, before that time, I was obviously connected through the university and through friends, et cetera. But uh, I think we are sometimes sort of hard on ourselves because I think that Muncie is seen by other similar cities. As, for instance, I would hear such things as, well, Muncie has a more diverse uh, industrial base than, than a General Motors town. And Muncie has the university, which is bigger. And Muncie has the Ball family and all of the, the uh, benefits from that. So from uh, communities that have, se have faced similar <coughs> problems, I think Muncie is seen as, as a success story. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on um, after living in the community for a period of time and, and becoming, I think, very active in the community is that Muncie seems to be a community that wants to hold on to its past for some reason. And one of the things that you get from people who uh, are, are telling you about, you, you learn then about this, uh, this um, political turmoil of its past. You learn about some of the racial turmoil. And certainly that's a part of any community that you need to know about. But just as an example, at Ball State, we know that 67% of our faculty have come within the last 14 years. So a lot of us are new to Muncie, and we see a different kind of Muncie. The history is important, the culture is important, and we, we need to know about that. But we are who we are today, and where we're going is a part of that group of people as well. And I think it is important to remember that the history plays a role, but it doesn't totally drive who we are, and we need to remember that. Larry Law, you've been looking at this town for a long time. Muncie has a reputation richly earned as a very political community in a very political state. Uh, and when I talk about political divisions, a very political community, it's, it is divided Democratic and Republican. It's divided, as suggested, rich and poor. It's divided labor and management. It has divided uh, Ball State and a regular community. And all of these divisions have had to uh, have uh, caused a problem when we try, as uh, Ray Sheely suggested in the opening uh, segment, to reach consensus toward uh, solving our problems. And uh, I've been in this community for the better part of 30 years, and I think we have seen in the last decade some real efforts to try to reach consensus to involve all of these segments of the community, 
But it doesn't always happen, it doesn't always work, and we still have a long way to go. We want to remind all of you again that this is your opportunity to participate in this live town meeting. Uh, you can t call by uh, dialing 74, I guess you don't dial anymore, that shows my <laughs> age. Uh, <laughs> you can call 747-4949 or 1-800-252-9472. And we do welcome your questions. This is your opportunity to participate live. Steve, can I make a comment, please? I would certainly like that. Um, this is kind of in response to what Dennis Tyler said. Um, in looking where we were and where we are today, I think we're an entirely different city. And uh, going back to economic development projects uh, that are worked on, a lot of times we get shoved in our face the 70s and the turbulent um, um, labor management relations that happened in this community in the 70s. And I don't know how we ever drop that image because it's, it's one that seems to come up. But one thing I will say, there has been maturity, I, I think, on both sides. You know, labor working with management, realizing they've got to work together for the, for the benefit of this entire community. So, you know, we can look at where we are, where we were, but we also need to look, I think, where we are today. And one thing that um, I know our economic development people do, when they have protective, prospective clients in our community, they take them to places like New Venture Gear to meet with labor, to meet with management, to see how they're working together, that this cooperation together does produce a much better product than the division in the past. And they go to Borg Warner and see, see the situation. So, you know, I compliment labor in this community. They certainly have worked hard um, to, to raise the standard, to work closer with management. Management has done the same thing. And the old days of, that I'm sure they still happen in some situations, but the turbulent days have passed in the area of labor and management, I think has really quieted itself down. And um, there's been a maturity on both sides. I think this community has been anything from today. Uh, let me use the first question from the telephone tonight to uh, uh, pursue this subject a little bit further, uh, not on the uh, uh, labor management basis. Local city and county government seem more interested in fighting than cooperating to get things done. What can be done about this? Dennis, your party role means that you're affiliated with both. I want to say that again. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I, I don't necessarily agree. I think that, that, that uh, uh, you're going to always have agendas. You're going to have a Democrat agenda. Democrats uh, support working people, want to see to it that working people have, uh, have a good quality of life, and, and, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm never going to apologize for doing that. And uh, sometimes you have to take tough stands to, uh, to uh, realize that concept. Uh, you know, I watched the Democrats on the city council the past four years work hard, very, very hard to help bring the city back into a balanced budget without getting much credit for it. And, and, that, uh, and that does create some division and problems when, when you're trying to, to move forward. But uh, I don't see all the... Uh, the uh, political infighting in, in, in the city and county government. Now, if you're talking about a UNIGOV pro program, yeah, true, because I don't, I, I don't believe in UNIGOV. I don't think UNIGOV works. I, I think UNIGOV ends up being a very costly program as you go, get into the privatization and, and contracting out. So if you're talking about that part of it, I agree. Early, we're Steve, hearing a lot. Yes, add to that? please do. Just briefly, because I get to see lots of local governments around the country in my work, and I think the level of cooperation that we're seeing now not in the past, but today, between the city and county is terrific. And I'm delighted to see it, and I think much of it's bipartisan. It's not perfect, but people aren't perfect. And there are many agendas and many needs out there, but I think we're seeing a level of cooperation that I don't see in very many communities. And I think it's exciting, and I think it bodes very well for the future. And I think the people who are currently in office, many of them deserve a great deal of credit for taking us to a new level. I think the image that the question suggests is, from what I can tell, was very true in the past, but I think we've come a long way. And I think a lot of people in both parties and in both city and county deserve credit for that. Mr. Mayor, uh, our Republican representative, you certainly get an opportunity. Before we go to our first uh, question from the audience, you got an opportunity to, uh, to talk about the cooperation of the city council and the mayor's office uh, on fixing the budget. Um, let, me, let me comment just for a second on the city and the county. I appreciate okay. the, the um, cooperation we have with city and county. I think any entities, any two entities that work together are stronger than, than, them, than them apart on that. Um, there is a natural division because it's, it's a predominantly Democrat skid <clears throat> at city council and I am a Republican. So we have some different ideas, some different agendas. But I will give the city council credit. Um, we were able to communicate. <clears throat> we know up front that we're not going to agree on all issues. Just as it was, if it was a Republican council, there would be some issues that they probably would not agree with me on. Uh, the actual budget was a, it had to be, no one person could take all the credit. 
for where the city was and where the city is today. Um, it, a lot of people worked together. Uh, city council was involved. Uh, the administration was involved. I made decisions like laying people off uh, that were not pleasant decisions but had to be made because of the circumstances we were in at that point in time. So those are tough decisions that had to be made. But at the same time, the city council had to step forward and transfer money, which again was tough decisions. They were facing, in some situations, I remember some hostile audiences that they faced out there. Um, uh, as they were moving money around, as they were having to transfer to keep the city operating, they were not pleasant decisions for them. So no one entity can take all the credit. I can lay people off. You know, that is a function that the administration can do. But I can't put the money where it needs to go to pay the bills. That, that takes the city council to do that. It has to be a cooperation between the two. We can certainly have differences, and there's no doubt we're going to have differences. Um, but on major issues for the betterment of the community, I think we always come together. And a lot of, it's con a lot of government that I found out when I came in, it's a word I didn't really use very much when you own your own business, is compromise. And it's, it's, a, it's a word that sometimes I don't use well enough, um, but it takes compromise on both sides. Because if, you're, if you draw a line in the sand and stand behind it, you're probably going to accomplish nothing. I'm sorry, but I, I can't, uh, as a reporter for many years, I have to point or have to let you all know that the president of the city council is sitting over here going like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little aside. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, good evening. Uh, first, would you mind repeating the uh, comment or the question from the person that uh, telephoned in on the card there? Oh, my. No. Oh, uh, cooperation, city, county, government. Uh, no, but would you repeat the question? Well, if I can find the car, yes. Local, city, and county government seems more interested in fighting with itself than cooperating to get things done. What can be done about this? Well, my name is Ed Knatzer. I'm a Delaware County Commissioner. I came tonight just to listen, but I feel compelled to uh, give some answer to that question personally. Uh, I know the uh, impact that, uh, that we have had collectively, city and county, in, in cooperation working together. And uh, I'm not sure uh, where that, uh, that caller uh, has been, but uh, he hasn't been in Muncie for the last three or four years, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm proud of the success that we've had working with uh, the city of Muncie. Uh, people tend to think that we're divided, that there's city and county. We're not. We're all in this together. And so we have to come together to pool our resources and do something that's really effective. And uh, I think Dan uh, will admit just the cooperation that city and county have had uh, in, the, in the last four years have really been, has really been effective. We have a uh, consultant that we have hired in Washington, D.C. to lobby for uh, federal funds for Muncie and Delaware County. That's a collective effort. We have a city county engineer. Uh, we, we work on a lot of projects together that are, are collective projects, a comprehensive land use plan. I'm not going to go on and on and on, so I'm not sure the, the perception that, that people have generally about city and county government, but all you need to do is get involved and you'll find out that there's a broad base of community, both pro public and private, uh, uh, on, on uh, the city and the county level that are working hard to achieve the kind of goals to dispel some of the myths and rumors about Muncie and Delaware County. I'm proud to be from Muncie and Delaware County. And, and I think that that's the consensus of the people now that are involved. Dennis Tyler, uh, Brenda Trehune, Dan Cannon. There's a great group of people that are involved for the betterment of the community to set politics aside once the election is over, so I'll it'll, sit down. It'll have to be more than three or four years, though, Ed, and you'll have to recognize that before people's perceptions about government are going to, to change. Uh, we had a consultant in here uh, as part of the comprehensive planning process who conducted three community forums, and, and at the end of those, his assessment was he has never been, in all of the communities he's assessed across the country, been in a community where there was more mistrust, more skepticism and cynicism about local government than there was, is in Muncie now. And so uh, I think it's been easy for uh, a Republican administration in City Hall and a Republican majority on the Board of Commissioners, which is sort of an unusual alignment of the stars uh, in, for Delaware County, uh, to come together. The, the proof will be whether we can do this in, in five years and 10 years and 15 years from now. Can I say something uh, well, on that, Steve? Yes. Please. I think the Muncie newspaper needs to take some of the credit and some of the blame for some of the skepticism and some of the problems that have been created and some of the negativism over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen some awfully honorable people in this community try to do some, some very honorable things at different times that have, they, they've certainly been lambasted over. And uh, uh, I think that that's, that's created some problems. One of the things in a... Uh, labor management meeting that I was fortunate enough to set in on early last 
1999. One of the biggest <laughs> concerns that I heard out of probably 17 or 18 people that was there was the negative reporting on this community when there wasn't anything negative to write about. I have to give you an opportunity to respond. <laughs> well, it's, it is a, a popular sport to shoot the messenger, uh, but uh, we don't make this stuff up. When public officials get indicted, uh, we report it. Uh, when factories leave town, uh, we report it. Uh, it's not that we can uh, uh, say everything is good, and it's, as one editor once said, uh, uh, yeah, I'd be glad to report that this is a world of flowers, but this is a world of flowers and a world of pain, and sometimes we have to report the pain as well. Hurley Goodall, you haven't uh, been heard from down there for uh, a few minutes. And, and let me just... I'm listening to all these platitudes. Yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if I live in the same city. <laughs> uh, well, I was, just going, I was going to ask you, in fact, uh, we've pretty much heard that, yes, this community had problems, but we've come a long way. Yeah, we've come a long way, I agree. There's no question about that, but we also have to remember that we're a community that can't annex any place in the, in, the, in, in the near city. People fight it all the time. We can't get countywide library service in this community. We have a history of things that we cannot get done that we have to be honest and face up to and begin to deal with, and I hope that's what this forum is all about, to make us face some of those problems and to be able to move forward. I think we can if we work together. Uh, first person I think up was at the, la or the, uh, the black microphone. Uh, my name's Jared Hall. I'm a student at Ball State University. I'm not from this area, but uh, working on this project and doing a lot of research, I have learned quite a bit about the community from Mr. Goodall and uh, from other area residents who've been here for quite a while. We have established that there are the social, the economic, the racial divides, and there's been a lot of criticism that there aren't, uh, that there isn't enough black representation or racial, racial representation and diversity at the city and uh, county level, even with the police department. Uh, last week, uh, Chief Winkle said there is at most 10 uh, black officers on the force. Would having more racial diversity help the situation any? or is there enough uh, representation already to work from the problems that we have now and make things any better? Oh, are you are asking Mr. Good all that or anything? Yeah, just go for it, Dennis. Oh, absolutely not. We need, we need more diversity in our, in our forces. On the fire department, uh, we need more diversity. We need more diversity throughout this community, absolutely. There's not, not nearly enough. And there's more than enough qualified people out there in the African-American community and other communities that, that uh, we could create a much, much more diverse workforce than what we have right now. I totally agree with Dennis Tyler on that. Um, it would be nice if our departments mirrored our community, and they certainly don't at this point in time. Uh, we, there's some strides have been made. You have your first female firefighter that's on there now. Um, we have two black uh, female police officers, but we're a long, long way from where we should be. And the biggest problem, because I sat six years on the American Commission, I think the biggest problem we have, and we could probably sit here for two hours and lay blame, is getting enough applicants in the pool to start with. Uh, we, we need to somehow reach out more as, as a city, as a community, and encourage more applicants to apply for our police department, our fire department, and other positions. They're out there, they're very qualified. Uh, when they come on, they certainly, it makes the situation so much easier if we have diversity in our police department and our fire departments as they go out and do their job. Uh, it's much easier for them to do that. But we need to strive harder as a community, as a um, city, and I'll take responsibility for that. We are under the merit system, and so we do follow under state law and how we do do our hiring and how we do our hiring for both our public safety departments. But a greater sense of diversity within our departments is, is a goal we have to have. We have several questioners up, and I want to try to move along. Uh, so, And we have more from uh, the telephone as well, from the red microphone. I'm Bruce Weimer, president of the city council. And I'd like to say uh, all the negative about Muncie, and I've been there on the negative side. It doesn't work that way. I've spent four years on the council. I've started uh, the fifth year. And I'd like to say the mayor and I, we're getting along well. We're communicating well. The city attorney, we've had numbers of meetings on different issues. And Larry, I think sometimes when things are going good, your paper gets things stirred up. 
<laughs> <laughs> because what you print, and you can get it in your mind, however, that you're reporting the news, the little digs, and calling me at home, not you, but some of your reporters, and trying to get something started. I, I, I don't think the paper is helping our community any by doing that. Thank you. You're welcome to come in at any time you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think uh, the uh, discussion, public debate over the role and performance of uh, the media, whether it's radio or television or newspaper, is a healthy thing, and I welcome those criticisms, and I urge people frequently in my column to call me and talk to me about these things, and, and they do. And uh, so yeah. I do appreciate uh, Bruce's comments, and we will disagree from time to time. But when we see something we like, we'll say so. And if we see something we don't like, we'll say so. And uh, you know, we'll take the lumps along with other people who are in public life. Another question from our audience. Thank you. I'm Cassie Griffin. I've lived in Muncie for 63 years. And I want to say to Larry Law that we're glad we do have freedom of speech and thanks for him being able to print people's views. But I do think that out of the time that I've lived in Muncie all my life, that there are some great people here and there are people that want to make changes for the better. And I think if we don't speak out on some of the negative, you know, how are you going to work with positive if you sweep the negative under the rug? you got to deal with it, and, and I think what we need to deal with is that African Americans want more voice. We are appreciative with Hurley Goodall and our ministers, but there is a population out there with different needs. And some people seem to think we're not grown up or old enough to make our decisions. I've served on a lot of committees, and I'd be waiting to see if we're going to be included. Many times we're excluded, and I think it's a habit but we can't continue to go this way. Whenever um, government money is to come into the city, uh, we'll have meetings and we'll sit there and voice our opinion and wait for things to happen and they don't get, they don't happen the way we talk about them. And I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but there is a lot of things that need to be done. There's uh, profiling on our youth and we, are, we care about our, our youth. I was at church tonight praying for our young people, uh, what's happening to them in our city streets. That's not only black, but white as well, because they come to our church. And we must be a caring people about the youth because they are our future. And I'm here hoping that maybe we can work together and people realize that there is a black population out there that has their arms open wanting to be a part of this community. Mr. Mayor. The <laughs> Uh, certainly, the police department was an issue in the last election. It was. And it is certainly an issue uh, in the African American community in particular. Uh, where do you think we stand now? How do you respond to that concern that's just been voiced? A lot of last year's, obviously, it was election year. That escalates anything that, that an administration does or anything that's going on, it escalates it to a higher level. Police departments are very easy. Um, you look at the Indianapolis election. Also, it was the police department was, was an issue down. It was different, a different type of issue in that they weren't being effective. And there was lots of murders going on. There was a lot of crime going on. The issue here was different, uh, which was um, we had some discipline issues that we dealt with in the first four years that surfaced. We had a very unfortunate police shooting, action shooting last year, resulting in the death of a citizen in our community. Those are not situations we like. Uh, what we have tried to do um, is police the areas through federal money that have the higher crime in order to try to return a quality of life to some of our neighborhoods out there, in particular Munciana Homes, which is, I spent 15 years with my business a couple blocks from Munciana Homes, so I think I'm fairly um, aware of uh, the, that particular area. Uh, a lot of good people down there. In fact, the majority of the people in Munciana Homes are extremely good people. And, and a lot of times the, the problems that happen in Munciana Homes are not the Munciana people, they're the people from outside who come in and create problems in that particular area, and then they leave at the end of the day when they, when they get their business done. And the police department has been very effective in doing their job. But it's kind of like the, the old story about the salesman. If the salesman says, if I don't get kicked out of a place once or twice a day, I'm not doing my job. Um, if a police force is out there doing their job, and I'm not saying they're perfect. We've obviously had some that have gone over the line. Uh, we try to deal with those as those are brought to our attention, those issues. But overall, I think our police department is an excellent police department that does a very good job for our community out there. No, they're not perfect. Um, but look at Montana Homes where it was before we started getting federal money, putting extra patrols down there, and where it is today. I think it's a much, much safer environment. Not where we want it to go. In fact, 
that's one reason we're looking at trying to bring federal money in to completely uh, renovate Muncie and Homes, tear down and put in more of a neighborhood environment. Uh, but um, I think our police department does a very good job in this community. I'd like to ask the mayor a question on that because the, the thing that I see is, is two separate ways of dealing with the problem. Uh, my perception is that the Ball State area is just as great a drug problem in our community as the Muncie area, but the approach is entirely different. It's massive police force in Muncie homes, but not massive police force in the Ball State area. And I very seldom see anyone going after the people who are supplying these drugs and bringing them into our community. The only ones that get busted are the young men on the street corner who are maybe making $100 a night. But the other people who are really financing the drug traffic are never going after. I cannot comment about you know, why somebody higher up is not arrested. What I can comment on is probably why, the, if, if, if your perception or if that is a true statement that the drug problem is as great at Ball State University as it is in uh, Muncie at Home, the difference probably is in Muncie at Homes it happens on the streets. It's out in the streets, it's much more visible, people are telling out there, and it's much more seen. What's going on at Ball State probably is not as much in the streets. I think that's probably one reason it's addressed heavier in the Muncie at Homes there, and that's where the complaints come from. You know, a lot of times police, police don't go out looking a lot of times for for situations to, to act upon, they, they react upon complaints. And when I came in office, one of the huge complaint areas was, was the drug problems, um, shootings that were going on down there, the crime that was going on in the Muncie Homes complex, and federal money was brought in to help eradicate that problem. It's, it's not a perfect scenario, no it's not, but we're striving, striving to make it better. Beverly, they mentioned the Ball State area. They did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, maybe that brings up an, an issue related to the university because statements like that frequently, well at Ball State, as the Ball State part of the community is seen as different, privileged, uh, perhaps uh, disconnected. I suppose every community has a town down problem, um, and I think probably we do too. Uh, I think that um, in situations like this, where, for instance, where we have students that cause disruptions, or we have uh, situations where neighborhoods uh, are affected by the university, um, it, it probably rises to the surface even more. Uh, I, I do have to say, though, that I think in the last few years, um, at least on the part of Ball State, we've attempted to um, reach out a little bit, uh, open those doors, try not to look like the gated community that I think sometimes we're perceived as being, to move away from just the campus environment and to move into the community environment. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of um, some of the work that our faculty did just, just on their own when we had the uh, decrease in jobs a couple of years ago. And we had 15 to 1,800 job losses, and we went out into the community and did some computer training just, just because some faculty wanted to do it. Um, that's just a little beginning, uh, but I think that um, any community like ours that has its major employer is a university, there's going to be that perception on both sides that somehow um, that's a privileged environment. Um, I don't like that. I hope that I'm one of the people that's trying to uh, reach out and indicate that the university community is part of the community. We live here, we work here, these are our children that go to the schools, and uh, the more that we can do that, I think the better we're going to be. And I need at this point, simply because of time, uh, to try and move ourselves forward here. Uh, we certainly had comments from almost all participants in the panel uh, that there is a, uh, a unique uh, period, at least, where there's a cooperative effort going on. And one of the things that has come up is a new master plan for the community, uh, which may have a lot to say about where we go in the future and whether or not we get there. And that brings me to one of the questions that was called in, which is Muncie's spending a lot of money on downtown. What exactly is going to get people there in large enough numbers to support all the money and develop? You're looking at me, so I assume you're asking me that question. <laughs> um, I saw a letter to the editor recently, and Larry didn't write it, so uh, it was written by another person, so I'm not blaming Larry, um, that said the downtown was dead, and I've heard that. That person obviously has not driven downtown recently. There is a re resurgence downtown, there's a revitalization downtown, and it was not one individual that did that. This, is, again, has been a community effort of uh, people in this community, both political parties, everywhere in the spectrum being involved to make, make our downtown better. It is an evolution process. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, how did, how did Muncie's downtown die? Did it do it in one day? Absolutely not. It did it over a period of time. It did it with some good intentions of putting a plaza downtown, um, 
that obviously was not, you know, in retrospect, that was, that was not probably the proper thing to do. But at that point in time, Muncie did it, as Anderson did it, as Richmond did it, as probably communities all across this country did that, did that same scenario. So now you go back and you try to recapture some of that. We're doing real well with our restaurants. You know, you're trying to bring restaurants in downtown, trying to bring investment to our downtown community. A couple of buildings have recently sold downtown. Um, so there's already investment downtown. One of the big issues is bringing, bringing actually, rest, well, two, I guess, bringing people downtown in two ways. One would be the Ball State. You know, how, how can we bring the Ball State students downtown? Because um, they have lots of money and they, they like to spend it. So let's bring them downtown if we can. And how do we get people living downtown? And you know, there's been a bit of discussion of a parking structure. Do we need, do we not need a parking structure? Um, in a nutshell, if you have residents downtown, every, every apartment has to have two parking spots. You start looking at development very quickly, you use up the parking space that's on, on the ground right now, and parking has to be convenient for residents. We're also looking at the issue of Ball State, you know, bringing those students downtown. So it's an evolution to bring it back, but in my, my personal perspective is, we are much further along one year you know, from when we started the, the groundbreaking downtown to do that. In my opinion, we are much further along downtown than I envisioned that we would be, but it's because so many people have come together in this community all across the spectrum, and brought, um, brought a cooperative effort and want to see something change downtown and are encouraged about downtown. The problem is not to let it stop where it's at, but to continue forward with the, with the forward momentum. Eric Kelly. May I give a slightly different answer? I think it's almost impossible to spend too much money on downtown. That's the heart of our city. One of the issues that came out in the comprehensive plan is concern about sprawl. But you know, if you try to deal with sprawl on the edges, it's like squeezing a balloon. It's got to go someplace you got to deal with the other side of sprawl, which is the downtown. And if we don't protect the downtown, you know, our downtown is surrounded by wonderful, vital neighborhoods that are still healthy. If we don't stop the decay with the downtown, we gradually lose those neighborhoods, and that hurts everybody. And from a taxpayer's perspective, you know, when a new restaurant goes downtown, the streets are there, the storm sewers are there, the water lines are there, sewers are there, everything's there. When that new restaurant goes out someplace, we gotta build all that stuff, and it costs money. Now we need new development on the edge because we're a growing community geographically, but putting development downtown is worth whatever it costs to do it. It's a good investment in our future. Dennis Tyler. Steve, I don't disagree. The downtown investment is a good investment in our future, but we have some neighborhoods that are dying, and we've got to address that. And, and the only way that we can address that is financially. And we can spend all the money we want to downtown, but if we don't do something in some of these outlying neighborhoods, they're gonna die also. And, and, and we can't allow that to happen because when, when they die, whatever happens to downtown is just going to be secondary. I agree, and there are about seven neighborhoods that basically surround the downtown that are priority areas under the new comprehensive plan for I've exactly that reason. And you're absolutely correct. Early? I just want to change. I've got a question that's been burning me because there's something, in, there's something important that's been going on in our community, and that's Ball State getting a new president. And I see where he, they've been introduced to the faculty, to the students, to the other people at the camp. But I'd just like to ask the mayor, has there ever been an opportunity for you to meet with those people as to what the responsibility they see of the university to the city that the university is located in? and vice versa, what the responsibility of the city is to the university. Is that ever taken into consideration? And the people that are gonna be making the decision don't live in Muncie. Now, I'm not complaining that, about that, that's the way it's structured. But the trustees that will hire that person, they don't live here, they don't have to live with that president. Three yeah. Well, three of them, but that's not a majority. <laughs> that's a minority. <laughs> I know, but three of them do. I, got okay, I just wonder because I haven't seen anything like that interaction between the city You're asking, and have county. I been invited to meetings with, the, with these new presidential candidates? Yes. Uh, yes, I have been. I have not been able to attend any of them. They've, they've been the dinners when they've been in town, and because of my schedule conflicts, I'm not able to attend any of them. Do you feel satisfied with their answer to what kind of responsibility they feel the university has to our community and what our community's responsibility is to them? I think that's part of the whole picture that we should be talking about here this evening. Beverly? I'd just like to comment that there was an occasion for each of the candidates that involved a lot of people represent wide uh, constituency of the community, and in fact, Ball State people were not there, so that it could be uh, a discussion about the community and the relationship of the university uh, to the community rather than an, an internal one. And all, also, I would mention again that everybody who works at Ball State, all the people who talk to all these people, all of us who are administrators there, we live in the community. We are the community as well. So. Uh, 
I would hope that we could begin to think of ourselves that way and think that you know, we have a vested interest in the president also having a good relationship with the community as well as many other people too. Just briefly as a faculty member, and I do have tenure so I can say this stuff, I think the university needs to do more in the community. I think we need to open up to the community, reach out to the community more. I am delighted that all three of these presidential candidates have an urban background. One's an urban historian, one's an urban sociologist, Greg Williams grew up in an urban area. They've all got some urban background, and I hope we'll see that. I'm not critical of the current administration. They took over a very different university. We're at a different time period, but I think we're at a period of time when it is critically important that the new administration open the university up to the community and reach out into the community, and I hope that will happen. Uh, yes, one I, just a follow-up comment. Um, there are a lot of initiatives that uh, we talked about, kind of the social initiatives and things like that, but I think it's important to know that there are an awful lot of initiatives that are economic development initiatives. Frankly, Ball State reaching out to the community is Eric. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of activity that I think has already begun. We all feel very compelled to uh, open those doors, to have a better relationship with the community, to serve the community in, in uh, more ways. But I think some of the grants, the best grant was mentioned, that's Ball State went after that HUD money to allow that program to happen in Muncie. Uh, there's another HUD project that Ball State went after the grant that will help it happen in Muncie. So there are a lot of things going on that really are benefiting the community, perhaps sort of behind the scenes, that Ball State is a part of. I don't mean to sound as if I'm bragging about Ball State. I just want to indicate that we do feel that we have an obligation to the community and that we have responsibilities uh, as citizens of the community, and we want to find the partnerships both ways. And uh, we're really committed to that. I'd like to make a suggestion uh, that, you, or, that Ball State University adopt a Washington Carver, a Longfellow, or a Garfield, and see if they can bring the achievement standards up for those youngsters and then transfer that to our other schools. This is why we always get these discussions about the opportunities that are there between the city and the university. And I know the mayor's uh, attended meetings where it's been discussed and we've had workshops and all, but uh, we still haven't found that formula yet that systematically says, here's a problem, how do we use the resources of the university, how does the city contribute, and how do we solve the problem? Quick comment on that, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> last month, the, uh, the <clears throat> Democrats on the city council introduced a uh, false alarm ordinance that is really a good ordinance, and it's a fair ordinance for everybody uh, on the false alarms for uh, uh, security systems and such as that. And uh, Ball State, who is one of the largest landowners in this community, gave the impression in the Muncie Star Press that they may no longer donate the, the $150,000 that they uh, uh, that they give to this city to help pay for fire protection. To me, for them to even consider that as the big brother in this community is incomprehensible. That one of the large, largest landowners in this community that's only paying $150,000 a year for fire protection would consider pulling that because of a false alarm ordinance. That's to me is the problem that Ball State has with the rest well, of the community. Well, that was a problem in the way it was communicated in the paper. That did not, in fact, was not what the administration said. Wait, you mean the newspaper didn't print that properly? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think the question was asked the university, what will you do? And they said, we don't know what we'll do. And, and you interpret that to mean that it was a threat to pull the money. And, you know, so it was said, it was said in the Muncie Star Press that they may, they may possibly pull the we'll money. We'll pull can that I, story and take a look at can it. I, can I make, uh, make a comment here? Go back, I guess, to... <laughs> 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 Going back to the city um, university relations, and Larry, I think, said it very well. Um, anytime as an administration we have called on people like Eric Kelly, Beverly Pitts, anybody out there, you know, they, they run forward. They never, um, um, do not come forward to help this community out. But it seems like that little puzzle we're missing. You know, I thought it was interesting this morning's paper that Purdue is looking at putting an incubator in our community. Um, you know, kind of reaching out to, to this community, I'm sure that, you know, to help uh, strengthen their, their force and probably from an educational standpoint. But somehow we've got to get a little bit more connected with Ball State. And I, I do not have that answer. If I had that answer, you know, we, we try to implement that. Um, but there's great cooperation uh, amongst the city administration and um, Ball State University, I'm sure, as I'm sure there's been in, the, um, in front of other administrations out there. Whoops. I've done that, that before. Cue, but, <laughs> <laughs> but somehow we need to bridge that gap just a little closer. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel obligated. I've got these questions on, on other subjects. We're going to have to move along here. Uh, phone questions. And compared to a lot of other places in Indiana, 
Muncie isn't very attractive. What can be done to change that? According to who? I mean, I, I, I think Muncie is a very attractive community. I, I, I think we've got a very diverse workforce. I, uh, we may not be the best looking men and women in. in <laughs> no. And I think it's got a lot of good things to offer. I think we've got a lot of tremendous, I think we've got tremendous problems in our community, just like any community that's got a, a, a population of 70 or 75,000 people. But I, I think that it's, that it's a tremendous community with, with, a, with a lot of opportunity. And, and I wasn't picking on Ball State by any stretch oh, of the imagination. Okay. Uh, it's a tremendous employer. It, it's, it's got a, it creates a lot of opportunity for our community in a lot of ways. But I don't think it's a bad community at all. Eric Kelly. I think it's a great community in a lot of ways, but there's a two-part answer. One part is we've got to do a better job of telling our story about things like the river trails and all the things that have happened with the White River and all, because we've got some terrific assets here that are unrecognized. The second part, though, is it's kind of like shining your shoes to go to a job interview. Our entrance corridors are kind of ugly, and the new plan calls for cleaning that up with better landscaping standards, better sign regulations. The city and county have made terrific progress in cleaning up the streets themselves, and that helps a lot. But you know, once you get into the neighborhoods, Muncie's terrific. The entrances don't look very good. Does having your shoes shine make you a better employee? No. Does it help you get the job? Yeah. And having cleaner entrance corridors would help change that image. Let, uh, since we're speaking of entrance corridors, another question from one of our uh, telephone uh, callers. How do we effectively regulate what seems like uncontrolled growth along State Road 332? What the new plans, I think the problem in the past with that has been that the city has pretended there wouldn't be growth along 332. If you look at the growth patterns of cities today in the United States, they grow towards the interstate highways and they grow along the major connectors. The city and county have in the past essentially had their heads in the sand saying, well, nothing's going to happen out there. Oh, that's just one more store. Let's not worry about it. The new plan recognizes that we've really lost the farmland in that area, that that's the direction most growth is going to go. Let's plan for it and do it right. Let's protect the corridors. Let's landscape them better. Let's control the signage and so on. By recognizing that that's probably what will happen, we can plan better, we can manage the development as it occurs. And I think as the new regulations are adopted over the next year or so, we will start to see a difference in the quality of development that comes in. And I think it will, I've seen it help other communities and I think it'll help Muncie. Another caller said specifically, we see all this uh, growth along 332 and all this talk about the growth Northwest. What about South Muncie? I think <clears throat> being, growing up on the south side of Muncie, uh, I think that, that the planning and the strategic planning uh, from everything that I've been taught, that it, it goes where uh, the, uh, the, the uh, population growth is and where the business growth is. I mean, I mean that's, that's what I've been taught. Uh, for whatever reason, though, if you have planners that uh, put together a comprehensive plan to set something up in one area and that's where they're going to funnel their money, of course, that's where the business is going to end up going. But is South, well, Mun is South Muncie a focus of the new plan? State Route 67 is going to make huge. We're seeing that already down there. That is a huge investment on the order of 332, and that will help South Muncie Absolutely. without doubt. Absolutely. A question? Future, yes. Harley. Yeah, I'd like to, for the future, I think we need to really have some vision, look ahead. I think in 25 or 30 years, the Indianapolis airport it's going to be overcrowded and there's going to have to be a reliever airport built. We should quit worrying about the Muncie Airport because it's located in the wrong place, will not work, and begin to work with Anderson, Newcastle, and other cities and make sure that reliever airport is built on the south side in east central Indiana. Yes. And that's one of the real visionary things we need to be doing as a community. Yeah. We, uh, we have two questions from the audience, and we're down to the last five minutes. So, uh, yes, your question, please. Uh, going back just a little bit to the downtown uh, development and revitalization, uh, you mentioned trying to pull more Ball State students in that area. What are you going to do to attract students to that area and pull them away from McGalliard? And also, Ball State over the years has kind of taken on the reputation as being a, a suitcase campus, students right. are here during the week and they leave. Is, is that going to tie in any way to try to keep all state students here on the weekends and take advantage of uh, things in the community? 
A couple things we can do, a couple things we're looking at. Obviously, as more entertainment venues are downtown, that should attract more students. But a lot of it is, first of all, it's habits. You get in the habit of going somewhere and you tend to go there, whether it's the village or whether it's out to the Gallery, like you talked about, or Walmart or Target, wherever it might be. So it's trying to break the habits. One thing we're looking at, and we've started some shuttles downtown, one for parking and another one now out to Ontario Assistance at lunchtime, is to try to try the shuttles in downtown. If we get a little further along, but the Ball State shuttle, make it convenient, make it easy for the Ball State student to either work downtown. Uh, one problem I keep hearing from employers downtown is you know they like to employ Ball State students because um, they're good workers and and um, uh, there's plenty of them uh, but they don't have places to park downtown so we got to make it more convenient part of that's the shuttle system and getting your students down there but once we get in there they have to have something to do and there are some nice restaurants down there that, that might not be what the Ball State students are looking for we looked at some other ideas downtown if you look at our plan for downtown it was developed by Dean Rundell and some other architects here in our community it calls for the area basically around the um, convention center now to be an ent entertainment area does not define exactly what that is, but it's more in the way of uh, venues, um, whatever they might be, you know, the ideas of maybe theaters or something like that. Maybe that's a long-range plan we cannot achieve for, but maybe we need to stop at some point in time and do a, a um, survey of all state students. Say, you know, what is like, what? Are, why are you leaving town on the weekends? You know, where, where do we go? What, what venue could we put downtown to bring you downtown? So again, it becomes a cooperation, working together, and finding out what the need is. Or there certainly there's a need in our ball state community to bring them downtown. Once we can determine what that is, then we can find a solution for that. All right. We Again, we just have simply run out of time. And uh, I know we had at least one questioner here in the audience who did not get an opportunity. And uh, I'm sure, and there are several phone cards here that I did not have a chance to, to ask. But uh, we really appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, that does conclude Muncie at the Millennium, a town meeting. We especially want to thank you or thank the U and Year 2000 Committee for its generous help and support that have made these town meetings possible. It's the hope of all of us involved that these meetings will, in fact, contribute to our search for a new community consensus. I'm Steve Bell. Thank you for joining us.